how this is different. Whoop, now we're we're recorded. Can you describe how this is different or than the way that you want that recorded? I just want to double check. I'm I'm saying that because we've had an AI um uh security issue. So that's why I'm asking. Oh, sure. Um, I'm I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Did we want this meeting to be recorded? Yes, I, I hit the record okay. button. I'm sorry. Just making sure. And the know. reason why I'm yeah. saying it is, as, as MRC knows, uh, we had an AI um, security breach last week okay. on this very issue. So that's why I'm asking. Thank you. Okay. No, that's sorry. Okay I should have let people know. Yeah. So, Beth, yeah, I'm so sorry the you interrupted you. Sure, no problem. The question is, how is this different? than um, what's been done in the past? How, how will people experience the work differently? Well, maybe Man uh, Manel and Fiduzi can address it. I can also add. Yes, uh, Beth, great question. Thank you for that question. Uh, how it's different from what's being done or what other people have thought of. Uh, these are real families providing family to family support, family to family connection and family to family um, navigation su uh, support, so understanding uh, the services, understanding the support that's out there. So it's really that family to family support. So it's not a staff. So uh, there are staff that that are families as well. I understand that, but these are families with uh, children with disabilities. So they understand another family struggle. They understand what they're going through. They understand the services that they need. And also we're not waiting for families to come to us. We are going to families. We are going to different communities. We are engaging. So we are taking steps to be out there. So we've worked with the Federation on focus groups, understanding that the needs of different communities. So that's how this is different because it's that family to family peer support with the understanding. And we, we all know that peer support is powerful. So hearing from someone that's been there, that's been through the process, that's been through the struggle that can help support you to navigate the systems, um, there's nothing better. And we've heard from other families how important this is for them and how it was easier to navigate the transition process, the services. Even at Mass Rehab, we are making sure that our services are more inclusive and more accessible. And the voices of our families are helping us do that more and more. There's always room for improvement at any agency, any program, any service. There's always room for improvement. But our family members, uh, they, they make our agency stronger, better and more accessible for all families. So that's the difference, that's what's different. Uh, for DOSA or the commissioner, I don't know if you guys wanna add more to that, but I think that the key thing is the family to family support and guidance. Thank you, Manel. Fiducia, did you wanna add? I just wanted to say that being, you know, as a family member and for us is more personal, personal experiences. So we're adding to the table that personal experience that challenges that we face every day. So it's different than when you call a staff or you connect it with other people that have just, it's it's a job for them. It's a daily life that we live with. And so it's our lived experiences makes it a huge difference than just anybody else. And the projects that we're working on is something that really, really we're hoping that make that a uh, huge connection within the families and make them a lot easier that, uh, for example, it's a one pager thing. One of the projects that we're working on is one pager information that, you know, when you are struggling, when you have a lot of challenges and you're dealing with uh, kids with, uh, you know, multiple um, uh, illnesses, you don't have that time to look at pages and pages. It's one page that resources, it's only one page that you just look at it if this works for you or not. So just to make it easier for the families. It's another one is access line. Access line is anybody can call and we're still, everything is on project and uh, on process, but we're hoping that, you know, just uh, easy, simple things, easy things that it comes from our personal lived experiences. So that's why I think it's extremely different than anything else that MRC has done before. Yeah, great. Thank you for doing I think you both, you and Manel said it well. You know, I want to say, Beth, that um, uh, we haven't been really family friendly. I don't mean that in a negative, it just, we haven't, um, right? It's just kind of, we've been focusing part, particularly on the participant, the individual that we serve and not necessarily all the connections around that participant. And that also includes participants who are also parents. 
Um, I want to also acknowledge that we have many of the people we serve that are parents themselves. So they are also caregivers. So I think it's really beginning to kind of have that conversation with within our agency to really be more open minded, um, as well as um, and I'll give you a specific example on next gen, one of the projects that are, are very much uh, uh, focusing on youth 18 to 30. We have a family partner embedded in that program. So they're part of the team. All right. Where um, so that's just an example. We kind of tested the waters first with Manel's uh, group, right? And trying to kind of talk about families and doing all the kind of cultural broking and reaching out to the communities and so forth. And now we're actually testing out what it is like to have a family partner, as I call it, a family inclusion leader on a program, specific program. So again, it's just another doorway to let people hopefully feel more welcomed, you know, because it can be such an intimidating process. Does Thank that you. answer your question, Beth? Okay, great. Uh, Julie, did you have a question? Oh, no, I was, um, yeah, no, I was just, I'm, I'm really glad that you're focusing on families more because I know that, um, you know, at that, at that point of transition, especially the early point, but uh, for a lot of, for a lot of young people, the family is just, mm -hmm. they're part of their team, like integral for, you know, mm -hmm that whole process and the families are the ones that guide them so i'm i'm happy to hear that and um i'm going to drop in the chat we at exceptional lives we we have resources that are directed at families to help through the process and i'll put something in the chat for that but um yeah because the yeah i mean i'm a parent too my kid just turned 25 so we've been through this and i know that um to be to work directly with families i'm really glad that you're working on it thanks thank you thank you um, Brenda? Yeah, first of all, this is just fantastic. You know, I'm sitting here like smiling as you're both talking, you know, as all three of you are talking about different programs. And it's great to hear some examples like the one pager. I think that's brilliant. You know, we all talk about that as parents, a parent of a 28 year old, as well as um, my work at AME. And um, to simplify. We're always at AME trying to think, how do we simplify? There's so much information out there. There's so much to sort through and people just get overwhelmed and then they, they get stuck, right? We just kind of pause. So um, <clears throat> a couple of things that came to mind for me. One is you talked about the Federation as partner, which is fantastic. I'm wondering how other community agencies like AME and the other folks here can support the efforts and what would be helpful for you from us. And so you don't have to carry that, you know, when you say badges, you're going to be overflowing with people wanting your support. And how can organizations that are represented here and other organizations really support you in that and take some of that burden off so you don't have to feel like you have to get through hundreds and hundreds of calls and contacts. So I'm thinking that, like, how do we support each other in your efforts? I think your efforts are fantastic. Um, and I had another question. I guess my other question would be, how do we find out about, because we refer a lot of um, individuals and families to MRC in our work, and how do we make sure they know about all the efforts you're doing so i guess where is there is there an easy way for us to stay on top of that as community mm -hmm. partners with you mm -hmm. those are two of my kind of practical questions commissioner i can take a stab at yeah go right ahead manel i was planning on you taking a bigger step <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, brenda thank you thank you for your question um the first part of your question, uh, I think it's all about leveraging what's already out there. So we're not trying to reinvent what's already out there. So that's why we always looking to partner and collaborate. So I think the best way that we can continue to do that, it's invite us to present to your group, invite us to present to what you're doing. If you have an event going on and you need the communities that you serve to understand what MRC offers and what's going on at Mass. We have our new initiatives. Let us know. We'll come to you and also be open for us to invite you to, to our group, to our support, to our team to present on what you offer so we can always look for ways to collaborate. 
MRC alone cannot do this work. Your agency alone cannot, not one person can do it. When we talk about, you know, the past leading up to signing of the ADA, making life better for individuals and, and families, there were all sectors coming together, different people from different parts of life coming together in collaboration. The disability community itself could not have done that by themselves. So there were other people coming together. So that's what I'm hoping we can do here, like get together knowing what we do so we don't go and, and you know reinvent what's already out there. So come, like let's continue to get uh, together, learning about one another and leverage that's already there and always look to partner and collaborate. And the second part of your question, how do you know about what we do? Uh, well, we started a workshop for families by families. So it's every quarter. So if you need information about our family workshop, you can put your email in the chat. I'll make sure to add you to our mailing list. And we also have a quarterly forum for, uh, for the disability community at large. So we all are, then, and these are topics that families tell us, these are the topics we care about, transition, employment, education, social activities, and all those things. These are the things that families care about. So these are, that's, and, and these are the topics that we discuss at our forum and our family workshop. And we also have a newsletter. So if you want to keep up on what we're doing, how we can collaborate, how we can partner on different projects, we are open to it. We're always looking to collaborate because that's the best way to go. I think the power is in numbers. So that's where the power is. That's where we can create change. That's where we can help to change the systems. That when we can continue to push because we've come a long way. We still have a lot more to go to make sure that youth coming up have better access to jobs, better access to education, better access to housing, employment, you name it. You know, the struggles are there. Like, yes, we've made a lot of progress. Don't get me wrong. And I'm proud of the progress the community is making. People like yourselves, you know, doing this work, you know, uh, making sure uh, the access is there for all individuals and all families. But we also understand we have a long way to go. And we can only get there through partnership, collaboration, and also focus on the mission, making sure that all families and individuals are able to have access and uh inclusivity in everything that we do. Thank you, Manil. I'm, I'm mindful of everyone's time. So and I know that we have Lola here as well. Um, so if, maybe after, if you have more questions for Manel and for Fiduci to hold on for a second so that we make sure we maximize the time. Is that okay? Um, so uh, Lola, do you wanna talk a little bit about MRC Connect and also the technology things that we're doing? All right, to let people know again, to look out for us. Uh, so hi, everyone. Uh, Lola here, um, Director of Strategic Initiatives at the agency. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the front-facing new innovative technology um, enhancements that we've been exploring at the agency. So for those that are not aware, we do have a centralized eligibility unit called MRC Connect. Um, it's a cross-divisional team that does eligibility for all of our various programs at the agency. Um, and the purpose of that is to pretty much streamline and um, make the process of getting services and supports easier for our constituents. Um, right now, MRC Connect is a hot topic <laughs> at the agency. We get on average about 1,500 applications a month, which is very, very high. Um, we just had our last month where we received almost 2,000 applications last month. So, you know, a lot of work is happening. A lot of our eligibility screeners are heads down trying to get people into the services that they need. So it's been um, an interesting experience with this new eligibility um, process, but people love it. Um, you know, we hear from our consumers all the time how they love how transparent it is. And, you know, the people at the Connect side, they're easy to engage with and they're easy to communicate. So we find some good things about that um, program. The one area where we are looking to improve is the volume of application, right? There's um, a discrepancy, I'm going to say, between, you know, the staff that we have and the volume of applications coming in. So right now we have identified some pain points in the process that we're looking toward some AI um, practices to kind of um, assist us in that process. 
So we are looking at an AI initiative along with our EOTS, which is Executive Office of Technology and something else, I can't remember, but the big IT program for the state, um, they are partnering with us along with Neurosoft to develop an automated intake form. Um, the idea is with this intake form that it would allow more autonomy back to the consumer where they could go in, fill out the form, almost like a TurboTax type of um, solution for those that have ever used that. And the purpose of that form is to kind of guide individuals to feel more empowered, you know, to share some of the things about their disability, um, some of their needs and supports and how MRC um, can support them, whether it's living independently in the community or looking for vocational work. Um, those are some of the things that we're hoping this new form will do. Right now, we're in the design phase where we're looking at AI combined algorithms um, and also using our predefined eligibility rules to assist us in determining eligibility quicker for our constituents, which is going to be super, super big for our MRC Connect staff that are having to sit down currently and interview, imagine, with 1,800 people in a month on top of the month that we're already in. So it's almost like a reoccurring, it's like a snowball effect. So right now we're looking toward AI to kind of help alleviate some of that. So we're hoping through this process, automating the intake and as well as furthering the streamlining of the eligibility process that the work can significantly improve and also efficiently improve the user experience and individuals can get to the supports they need in a timely and meaningful manner. So, so we can, more to yeah, come. Well, if I can, yeah, can I just interject for a second, Lola? Yeah. Um, just to give you an idea of our surprise of the demand, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we were projecting about eight or 900 a month. That was a lie. Right? Uh, and uh, that, that was pre-COVID. So we weren't using COVID numbers, all right? Uh, and now, as Lola said, we are continually seeing uh, these numbers rising from 1,700 to 1,800 to even a little bit more this month. Um, so be careful what you ask for. You want things to be streamlined, right? You want folks doing the kinds of grass rooting that Manel and Fiducer are doing in the communities, right? Uh, we're doing social media campaigns. We're also going to be doing a large campaign once our name has been official, is officially changed. So we're mindful of the demand. <laughs> so uh, we, are, we are disappointed that we can't be as responsive. It's about 30 to 40 days. We're letting people know it's about taking that long. And people have been incredibly kind and understanding, I think, knowing that it's the, what's the reality. Um, um, and we're going to see in this, in as Lola has shared, with this tool, it's an option. People will always have the option to talk to a human being, all right? Uh, but if they just want to streamline the process and go through it, um, we're going to test out this. And we'll be the first, actually, I think, testing out this type of tool. So stay tuned. <laughs> Lola, you want to add more? No, I think that um, you summed it well, Tony. I think one thing, um, you know, since we're in the spirit of collaboration, it would be nice um, maybe to come back at the next quarterly meeting or how mm. often we're having this, just to kind of show folks yeah. this is what we're doing. I know right now through our design process, once we get, you know, the IT mumbo jumbo out the way, um, we do want our providers to at least give us some feedback around like the type of language that we've been using and what's easier for the consumer because, you know, we do look at you guys as a pillar of support for our individuals because as Beno graciously mentioned, we can't do this on our own. We do rely on our providers and individuals in the community to kind of support the efforts for folks. So I would like to, when we're at a good spot, be able to present something to you guys so that way you can see the direction that we're heading in and you know we welcome feedback and any suggestions to obviously improve the process but trying to keep you guys engaged and informed as much as we can I think would be super helpful and it is very exciting thank you <laughs> um, Julie I think you're muted if you're talking I just uh, I just muted myself instead of unmuting. Okay, thank you, um, thank you guys so much. This is really exciting, and we'll make sure to have a have some way to to present that you know this this down the road. Um, but I wanted to let Jennifer ask her question. 
Good morning. Jennifer Bertrand from the Massachusetts Developmental Disabilities Council. I'm their disability policy specialist, and I applaud MRC for um, exploring innovative methods to help streamline things, to reduce wait times. That's wonderful. And it's really good to hear as well that if people do have a preference, maybe due to literacy skills or language barriers or other things, that they do have the option to actually talk to a person. Sometimes um, the experiences of families and and the family members that they're caring for with disabilities, um, there's so many nuances that it's hard for me to imagine how AI can account for all of those human things. But I applaud the, the innovation. Um, one thing that we hear a lot from the disability community, especially uh, families that are supporting a child uh, into their adult transition, who experience more significant intellectual and developmental disabilities, um, that it can be very challenging. And it's hard sometimes to find uh, providers or access services because um, they can sometimes be seen as too disabled. And I was just wondering, you know, what are some things that MRC is doing to help support individuals with more significant intellectual and developmental disabilities? Um, and those that may have some behavioral support needs, maybe because communication, they have complex communication challenges. I um, can also share that I'm also a parent and I have an adult daughter who has a significant intellectual developmental disability. And uh, while she lives in another state, uh, when she was um, during her transition process, uh, many vocational rehabilitation providers, no one would take her or support her when she transitioned during the height of COVID because she was seen as disabled. But we've also heard this from families uh, here in Massachusetts as well. And I was just wondering, does MRC have uh, information available in plain language for individuals um, to access that have intellectual and developmental disabilities? So that was a lot, but there you go. <laughs> well, do you want to answer some questions and then I'll add on? Sure. So right now, um, we do have, or we are have been working on rebranding our agency. Um, so we are trying to meet the need where, you know, people can understand what MRC is. You know, historically, we've had had these issues and even internally where we worked very siloed, right? There wasn't a lot of transparency. You know, we have like four different programs and everyone's kind of running things a little bit differently. Through our new initiatives, we've been trying to bring all of those silos together where we as an agency can be more transparent about the supports that we can provide to folks. So one of the biggest things that I've heard even now, like housing, that's been a hot topic in Massachusetts. That's something that, you know, across the board through our latest initiatives and our programs that we've been trying to be very clear about how can we best support individuals looking for housing and some other areas like that. Um, for individuals that have more of the severe disabilities, um, I think we've been partnering with other state agencies, right? Because it's not just MRC that, and I think there's this perception that MRC is supposed to be the only agency that should work with individuals that have developmental um, disabilities and everything else. But there is a, a process that we're trying to move away from where we are engaging with other sister agencies. So like DDS and DMH and some other folks that we do pull into the table. I know we had a program called the IRT, which is our integrated resource team that we explored a few years back. Um, and that pretty much brought all the stakeholders and all the sister agencies to the table where we would work with individuals that had developmental disabilities and we would be able to support them in developing their plan for employment. Um, and we found that through that process that the individual felt a lot more supported, the family felt a lot more supported and included in some of the decision making. So those are some of the things that I know we had started and we're continuing to improve on. Um, and I don't know, Tony, if there's anything else that you want. Yeah, me to I just to yeah, I just want to add, um, first of all, it, you know, the question that you're raising is really important. And we want to make sure too that we serve all people, right? Um, so one of the things that's part of MRC Connect, in addition to the eligibility process, is information and referral. Um, so you can have a call, you can call, just talk, talk to a human being. I just want some information, 
right? And there was no way to do that before, other than maybe if you walked into an office or you got you got the clerk that was available. So now part of MRC Connect is that whole package of information and referral. So maybe we're not the only agency, all right, to get served. You can also, and we give you a warm handshake, a warm handoff. Um, so that's one way for people to at least get to know what are the services that we have. All right, because it's still always a mystery for every state service, I think. Yeah. Um, and then, as Lola said, we have just signed an MOU with our developmental disability um, department um, with, with Jane Ryder. And we've agreed that we're going to help support individuals with intellectual disabilities, and they're going to be able to provide the longer term supports. Right. Because that's also always a challenge. Right. Where do we begin and where do we kind of end or where do we kind of, again, um, share the responsibility and the support. So that just has happened. And so that's a big one for all of us, I think. And then lastly, I want to say one of the things that we are particularly looking at is more wraparound supports. We know that we're seeing people with more complex needs. All right, we need more wraparound supports mm -hmm. and more to come on that. But again, referencing NextGen, this has been a project where we've been piloting and testing new interventions and wraparound supports as part of that with our family partners and with somebody with lived experience as part of the team. So those are some of the things we're trying to figure out. That sounds so exciting. Anything around customized employment since this has been research based and shown yes. to help so, individuals? Yeah, so NextGen is all about customized employment. Um, and we want to do more of that. I think, um, again, in context to young adults, it's also even more interesting to think about what are the entry points and what are some of the um, the internships that can help people have a broader perspective, right? Um, I think those are things that we really want. And I do want to say NextGen is experimenting with lots of things on, in that arena. That's fabulous. And I'm very interested in reaching out to you, Manu Man Manel, uh, did I say it correctly? Yes, um, uh, perhaps we can plan a time for you to come and present for to our council, uh, so our council members can be better informed and, mm -hmm. you know, have have a easier experience navigating the services and supports because it's really exciting to hear about everything that MRC is offering. Uh, I I did that a few months ago. Our uh, deputy commissioner is on the council, but I'll be happy to come back. Oh, okay. And also, just to let you know, MDDC will be our uh, featured topic pr uh, presentation at our forum on June 26. So, but I'll be happy to come back and and present again. Thank you. Can we take a moment just for a couple questions? Um, Julia, your question about literacy and participating verbally, was that answered by the, or do you have more? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, there's so many things to talk about today. I just didn't know if the actual AI system was going to be um, all writing or it could also be verbal as well, or do you not know yet? Oh, so that's exciting. That's why I'm very <laughs> excited to show you the demo. So um, in working with Commissioner Wolf and some other executive team members, um, when we first started going down this path and we had a lot of resistance coming down this path, you know, we were trying to think of like some of the things, you know, it's 2024, there's different things that we can do with this technology. Why not exploit them to our best, right? So part of the ask with our vendor for this form is that the form has different ways that it can be used. So right now the form has speech to text capability it has um, a combination of open-ended questions, and we try to keep that limited just because we do know there are folks that are that do have a little bit more of the severe mobility um, disabilities that you know they can't type as much. So they're able to do speech to text. They're able to type. There's also um, answer choices where it's like a checkbox, and I think that was the path that we started going down. We wanted to keep the form simple. We didn't want it to be overwhelming. And we just want to use the form to collect as much information as we can or that is really needed to determine eligibility. This is really meant to help support the consumer. Um, right now, we're also looking at some video interpretation. So this is more for our deaf and hard of hearing individuals where you know we could have 
a video recording of someone signing, you know, the questions on the left side of their screen so it can help them um, fill out the form and kind of guide them throughout the process. So there's a lot of things that we're envisioning for this form. But, you know, as Tony likes to say, everything costs money and I cost <laughs> Tony a lot of money. Tony likes to say that a lot. <laughs> she, she likes to remind me a lot. So, you know, there's a lot of things that we're envisioning for this form. Um, eventually, we want to pull in our, our online application, which is on a separate platform as part of this process. So um, there's a lot of work going on right now. There's a call about it right now. So I think in July, we would love to definitely demo it to you guys just so you can see all the functionality in that form. That's really exciting. Thank you. That'd be great to demo it. Um, Joanne, you have a question? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I just have a quick question. Is, is, is there any plans to have this application process and application process for all adult agencies? I mean, I know we've had this discussion in the past that you know, one application for all agencies. So if you guys, you know, say, oh, no, you're not eligible, but you might be eligible for this agency, can they use the same application? Is that in the work at all? Because <laughs> it's been an issue in the past. So, oh, go ahead, Tony. Do you want to go right ahead, Lola? I was curious so, what you're going to say. <laughs> Tony had graciously volunteered me to be part of the AI governance board with EOTS. Um, for those that don't know, EOTS is our lead IT um division. So they kind of give the yay and the nays on what we can do as it relates to AI or anything um, that's going to be consumer facing through technology. So in this governance board, this is something that's actually come up because we are actually leading this process. And I believe MCB is not too far behind us with the AI work. Um, this has come up where, you know, we do want to pretty much mimic what we've done with MRC Connect, right? We have all of our programs and they're all using one form. So this is something that we've just started the discussions on last week in terms of, well, what would that look like? Um, we have different ACIOs, which are our assistant chief information officers at the table. Um, and we've started the process of kind of looking at, well, what does it take and what does everyone have as part of their eligibility process? What is everyone currently using for their applications and how we can kind of come together to make it one singular thing? That is not an easy feat because we all have different ideas and different directions of where we want to go for our own individual agencies. So I think right now we're just trying to get to know the personalities at the table and then try to find the happy middle ground of what this could actually look like a year from now or two years from now. And it's actually really um, timely because of the work we're doing now. I feel like we can use this to kind of leverage, well, we know it works because we did it and it's been great and consumers are using it and, you know, it's timely. Um, it's less confusing, you know, so there's some things that are happening through that AI governance board that we just started. So um, it's nothing new, Joanne, but it's just a, a matter of meeting of the minds and kind of finding the, the middle ground between all of the 30 different people at the table. Well, I just want to add, <laughs> if I could just add, uh, you know, for MRC to do MRC Connect, if this was a two and a half year project. Um, um, and not everyone's still happy about it within MRC, right? Because it changes everyone's role when you centralize something, right? Um, and to have all the programs agree on one eligibility in need was enormous, right? Yeah. Because everyone feels like, well, I need this information and I need that information, right? When you really don't need that kind of information, really? Mm -hmm. Really, do you really need it? Um, that's the question that I know Lola said many, many times. So those are the questions that we had to do just within our own agency to have all our programs, um, community living and VR uh, in one, one unit. But now we see the number of calls that we're getting. I mean, we have data like no other. I can now say we're seeing 1800 people a month in, in intakes. I couldn't have that information before because it was so scattered throughout different programs. So I think people will begin to see some benefit of that. Yeah. And maybe and, other agencies can utilize it. And on top of that, I think that also just opens up the discussion to what do we have available in our toolbox as right. a state agency across the secretariat that we can use to further enhance um, our processes, because there's no reason for us to have, you know, 
consumers going back and forth and they're confused between DDS and MRC and uh, DMH. They don't know what we do or we're providing the same services to the same consumers from different agencies. I can't tell you how many times that's happened, but you know, this has opened up the discussion to a lot of things as the AI work. Um, and, you know, for us to take it even up to EOT, which a lot of things get shut down and to actually have their support and really commend us on the work that we're doing really says a lot. So, you know, we're very happy that we're able to kind of go down this path and Thanks for Tony for fighting our battles because <laughs> they were not happy when we first uh, uh when we first proposed the AI work. So they've come a long way in that regard. Thank you. So we thought that would just give you a little bit of the flavor of what's happening within MRC. I do want to say that another project that we're doing is the cliff effect. And I would love at one time to really have a presentation with you just to let you know some of the things we're trying to do addressing the cliff effect. And when I mean that, that means as we see people and as we are committed to trying to get people into higher wage industries, all right, uh, what often happens is people either choose not to take those positions or reduce their hours when their increase, when their salaries have, have increased because of the benefits. So we would love to be able to kind of share with you a, uh, a wish a wish project. There's no guarantee, um, but I'm gonna just say you have to have a wish project. Um, uh, so I'll, we'll be able to share that in, in, in the next time that we meet, that'd be great. That'd be great, yeah. Um, Julia, you have a question? Yeah, again, just <clears throat> what everybody's saying in the chat, I think all of this sounds really exciting and um, really appreciate your vision and your leadership commissioner and the obviously very talented and passionate staff you have working with you. Yes. Um, this is maybe too much in the weeds, but I'm, as I'm thinking about the families we work with, so much of what they access is, well, it's like you were saying with the one pager, is it's really dense and it's yeah. not written in plain language. Yeah. And what we found, and we're not um, a poster child for being successful in doing this all across the board either, but that when we, there's a lot of expertise about writing things in plain language for people who have intellectual disabilities. And we've found that that really is a level that makes things accessible for everybody. Um, and so I just wonder how you're incorporating that into everything that you're talking about, because um, there's so much lingo in, in all of our worlds. My favorite topic, as MRC knows, is at the acronyms that we use. Oh, my goodness. I just heard a new one uh, that Fiducy used. Um, we love letters, three letters in this state. Um, so I think we're really committed in trying to have simple speak, for sure. Uh, and in our marketing and branding, we've really been very thoughtful around thinking, for, you know, as to the audience. We're not writing for ourselves, and yet we tend to do that, <laughs> Right. Um, and we use our own language unintentionally that often kind of divides us. So I think we've been really thoughtful with some of our branding language um, to try to be as simple. And I know that the intake form that Lola worked, worked very diligently on is also about trying to simplify the process. Lola, do you want to add more to that? Yeah. Um, so in our AI work, um, we are using something called um, naturally speaking, which is tech talk for pretty much, you know, we're using common day language. Um, I think the level that we're trying to keep ourselves or hold ourselves to is like a fifth grade reading level. Um, that's been our practice since I've been at the agency, at least where, you know, we do go through that process of keeping it at that reading level. We do also try to get feedback. So I had mentioned like, I would love feedback from you guys when we demo it because maybe you have ideas in terms of how we're communicating or how we're phrasing things that may be confusing to folks. So we are trying to engage with other stakeholders and our other ERGs at the agency. So we do have like a disability employment resource group at the agencies. We have our black managers group, um, just kind of getting those groups and, you know, the where they lie from an intersectionality level to make sure that you know we are trying to make the language accessible and understandable to anyone you know there's no reason we should have a data dictionary to fill out an application right it should be very simple and easy to understand so that's the practice we've been applying 
for us on the AI side, it's a little easier just because, you know, it's technology. You can kind of shape it to whatever you need it to be. I think what we have been trying to do as an agency, just as a cultural shift, is trying to get our staff to kind of conform to that. You know, they refer to themselves and the agencies as many different things, but through the process of our rebranding, we've been trying to, you know, simmer down or like Tony says, moving away from these acronyms and, you know, these agency words that only we understand. So that way we're all speaking English, so to say, um, just a universal language. So that's some things we've been working on through um, the AI work and then also the cultural work at the agency. You're muted, Julie. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, just to follow up, um, I'm sure you've done this, but have you tested this with um, with clients, with people with disabilities to assess all the, how easy it is and everything? So we are still in the design phase, but that is 100% our goal. Um, we did something very similar when we developed the online application. Um, I don't know if you recall, Manel, we had the disability leader um, group um, give their feedback. We went through the form and they were like, you know, this doesn't make sense. And I have a brain injury and I'm confused. So it was a really fun process, obviously. Um, and the feedback was really, really essential to where we are today. So definitely when we are at a point where we can start demoing, we do want to start engaging just not even the disability voices or the groups, but other stakeholders that anyone that you know, could potentially interact with this form. We just want to make sure that we have input from all of that. And I know the next thing Tony is going to ask me is, is it manageable? Just making sure we're not overwhelming folks, but we will have strategies that we will work on with our vendor and also with executive leadership and our um, other groups at the agency to kind of support us in that process. That's great. That's great. Julia? Thank you. <clears throat> Um, thanks. I have one other thought, uh, just kind of a seed to plant that I would also need to go back to our to our staff about. But what I'm thinking about is, and I think this is true of some of our the other people that are participating here today, is we certainly get calls on our helpline from families who have transition age youth. Mm -hmm. And if as you're developing materials, or maybe you're already planning on doing this, if there's something succinct so that we could offer them the chance mm -hmm. to know how to access whatever you think the kind of entry point would be if they're um, at pre s age or if they're closer to 22 it just may be a way to funnel offer for us to offer resources that are going to be more streamlined for folks i don't exactly know what that would look like but i if it's something that you all think would be helpful we could certainly bring it back to our helpline staff to brainstorm it with you I think that would be helpful and uh, maybe this is an offline conversation Tony because i know we've been yeah. trying to do some work with Priets and I didn't mention, but we are working on a provider portal um, to kind of support the additional efforts that we've been doing. And one of the things um, related to Priets was trying to make the facilitation of that a little bit easier for the parents and also the consumer because there is a communication gap somewhere. We don't know where, and we're trying to figure that out. Um, and we're trying to leverage again through technology some of the ways that we can kind of address the needs and some of the gaps that we've been seeing with the parents, with the agencies, and even with the providers trying to assist the student. So it would be helpful maybe um, if mm -hmm. we could talk offline and include some of the folks here, Tony, to talk yeah. about what yeah. that would look like. I know we've engaged with Attleboro Enterprises and Triangle to kind of assist us, but it would be nice to have mm -hmm. some other folks at the table to assist us as well. Yeah, I exceptional lives would definitely be interested in that too. Cause yeah, I'm glad I'm glad you brought that up, Julia, because um yeah, with this with this new exciting, awesome stuff coming out that you guys are doing, you know, each of us in our in our programs can put the word out and help our audience understand what's happening and how to access it. So yeah, that we can all help um make sure that this word gets out. So thank you. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. A quick question. It, what about for um, Spanish speaking or other languages? I know like you're doing so much, it's a lot to ask to have it in more than one language, but I'm just wondering if what you thought about that. So 
in our new, well, even in our existing form, but I'm going to talk about the new things that we're doing. In our new AI form, there will be nine different languages available. And these are the nine languages that are most predominantly served by folks um, receiving services from MRC. So we will have that available. The other thing is, um, as we said, MRC Connect is truly the front door to all of our services. Um, as part of that, we do recognize and we have the data to back this up that, you know, after English, predominantly the second language that we encounter most would be Spanish. Um, so we do have dedicated Spanish speaking um, screeners that, you know, work with folks that only speak Spanish and, you know, English is their second language. So we do have that. We do also have a translation line. So if we get someone that speaks Russian, we can also accommodate from that. That's a cost, but we are, you know, absolving that through um, some of the work that we're doing with our EHS IT team. So we do have um, instances where we do need to support individuals with other languages. The other thing that came up, and it's so funny that you mentioned that last week, was because this form can be translated into different languages almost instantly, right? You just click it and it changes the language. Um, the conversation came up about, you know, if an individual is typing in Spanish, how should we look at that, right? Would we want this AI form to maybe translate it back into English, right? Maybe not losing what they initially submitted, but translating it back to English. And one of the benefits that I saw with that is that would literally eliminate the language barrier, right? So folks that couldn't work with mm -hmm. individuals that applied and only spoke Spanish, now you can read their intake form when they wrote it in Spanish, it's translated in English. We don't have a language barrier, right? We can kind of think of different ways to do and support individuals. So um, we're still playing around with that idea, but more to come on that. But we definitely do have, or will have um, different languages available to folks. Wow. Thank you so much. This is this is really exciting, and I'm I'm so glad that all four of you um, were here to share your perspectives. It's interesting to see like the really high tech, and then the 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 personal family involvement that you spoke about, Perdosa. So um, I want to thank everyone. Uh, also respect people's time. People are having to leave for other meetings. Um, so um, thank you all for being here, and especially you guys from MRC. Uh, and just just quickly to reiterate that um, we don't have another meeting planned, but it sounds like you guys have some things that you want to mm -hmm. share with this group. So we'll talk about that okay. in our planning through DTF. But in the meantime, we will be starting a, this listserv and um, and we'll invite you all. So anything new coming up, we'll we'll still be in touch. It might it might be a way to actually be in better touch, um, you know, in a, in a consistent way than what we've had now so um so we're looking forward to that and um and to you know supporting you in any way to to share this with families across massachusetts so thank everybody for being here well thank you thank you for having us really appreciate your time thanks everyone yeah. thanks mrc bye, bye. Thanks, julie bye guys bye